name is Topes. Presuming you're interested, I can teach you sorceries, as promised. Elden Ring has been out for a few months now, and I'm sure most players have had an experience that goes something like this. You find a cool character, complete their quest, and... Oh. I guess they're dead now. A lot of side quests in this game end pretty poorly, often resulting in the death of at least one character involved. This isn't always the case, but some quests end so poorly that you might wish the game just killed the characters instead. My... Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and Elden Ring all follow this trend, and this tragic tone has become a staple of the genre. A lot of characters do achieve their goals, but even these quests often end with almost spontaneous death. Only 5 of the 22 unique quests avoid ending in some kind of tragedy. This is part of the game's philosophy, but a handful of characters can actually get a pretty happy ending if the player knows the correct steps to take on their journey. So, instead of seeing another quest that kills a lovable character, and, in return, gives you a spell that you don't even have the stat requirements for, let's see which quests actually end on a positive note. First on our list is Bach, the Demi-Human. If you didn't find Bach on your first playthrough, don't worry, you're not alone, since he starts out disguised as a tree in Limgrave. Oh, why won't anyone look me in the eye? I, I'm not that ugly, am I? Attacking this tree reveals Bach's true demi-human form. The demi-humans are described as small, but violent and brutish, becoming even more feral when night falls. Bach seems much friendlier than the rest of his kind, but it looks like he didn't really get along with the others, and it may have actually been another demi-human that turned him into a tree. When they threw me out of the cave, they took everything I owned, and so this is all I have to express my thanks. I hope you can forgive me. You can later find Bach after he attempts to retrieve his belongings, but he was injured by the pair of demi-human chiefs living inside of the coastal cave. If you take on these demi-humans yourself, they'll drop tailoring tools and a sewing needle on defeat. My mum was a seamstress, and that sewing kit was all I had to remember her by. I always wanted to be just like sweet old mum. Now, for future encounters, Bach can alter the player's armor for the purpose of min-maxing stats or just for getting that perfect fashion statement. He can later be found in various locations throughout Leonia and the Altus Plateau, and he's generally considered one of the most loyal NPCs in the game. My lord, my lord, my lord! Please become Elden Lord, and please let I, Bok the Seamster, remain at your side. Bach later becomes interested in Queen Renala's powers of rebirth, which would allow himself to be reborn with an appearance that he thinks would better honor you as his master. The player has two options here. The first one is to give him a larval tear, which are the cores of the silver tears found in the Eternal Cities and are used for rebirth. Bach will successfully be reborn with a human appearance, but all he can do now is give a blank stare, and he will be found dead soon afterwards. The toll of rebirthing seems to have been too much for him, which might remind you of how in Dark Souls 3, the process of rebirth can leave one transformed into a man-grub if abused too much. To let Bach get his happy ending, you have to first find a prattling pate found by a group of demi-humans in Mount Gelmir. This pate is characterized by unconditional love and unrestrained assurance. It must have been a mother speaking. Using this in front of Bach helps him accept himself, despite his appearance. You're beautiful. Did I just hear my mum speaking? Thank you very much. Mum was always the only one who said I was beautiful. And now, my dear lord, let me hear her voice. There's no reward for this, but it lets Bach get the ending he deserves. I, Bach the Seamster, am forever in your service. May the throne of Elden Lord be yours. Next up is Latena, the Albanoric. First, we should note that Albanorics are man-made life forms that are cursed by either having legs that eventually give out, or by looking like this. Once again, we have a quest that begins by attacking an object. Please no, dear me. I haven't a clue. No secrets lie with me, not a one. This is Albus, an Albanoric man found in Leonia who is initially disguised as a pot. Wait then. You're not one of them? Well, what a relief. 
After realizing you are not what he calls the curse monger, who destroyed the rest of his village, Albus entrusts you with a half medallion so you can deliver it to a woman named Latena. This curse monger Albus talks about is actually Sir Gideon Ofnir, who seeks to find both medallion halves by any means necessary. At the slumbering wolf shack in Lyurnia, you can find Latena mourning the death of her wolf companion. Have you come to take more from me? Was my other half not enough? If you show her the half of the medallion that you received from Albus, Latena apologizes for confusing you for Gideon's forces and comes up with a request. Will you show me the way? To the land of Mikola's Halig tree. Latena then becomes a spirit so that she may guide the player toward the Halig tree, as she tells you that the other half of the medallion can be found at Castle Sol. Sure enough, it lies on the castle's roof, and completing the medallion allows the Grand Lift of Rold to bring you to the Consecrated Snowfield, the area right before Mikola's Halig tree. Keep in mind that this tree was chosen as a haven for the Albanorks, and it seems like the two halves of the medallion were specifically given to those with the most need of a new home. In the apostate derelict, shortly before where the entrance to the Halig tree is found, you see a huge, motionless Albanork woman sitting against a wall. Now, you learn Latena's true purpose. O oh, young yet towering sister of ours, let the birthing droplet in and create life for us, for all the Albanorics. Thank you. I finally fulfilled my purpose. Our young yet towering sister will give us hope. Now that nothing is left unfinished, I will join you in battle to the bitter end. And when the fighting is done, then you may lay me to rest beside Lobo, my dear wolf." So while Latena still technically dies, her efforts for the new generation of Albanorix make up for that and leave things on a generally positive note. Plus, you get to keep Latena as a spirit summon, who is simultaneously one of the best and one of the worst spirit ashes in the entire game. Our final character is Raya, the scout. She can first be found in Lyurnia, where she searches for new recruits for her house. Hello. It's rather chilly here, isn't it? The first part of her quest is entirely optional, but it involves retrieving Raya's stolen necklace from a nearby thief. You could choose to just kill the thief instead of buying the necklace back, but he's surprisingly a pretty chill guy. Never met someone with a taste for brawn or can trust. We'd make good mates, I reckon. I'll be seeing you. Doing this for Raya and then meeting her at the Altus Plateau will net you a free trip to the Volcano Manor, which is usually only accessible by traveling through the entirety of Mount Gelmir. Here, you'll meet the Recusants, a group of mostly tarnished that oppose the Earth Tree and are led by the masked Lady Tanith. It's worth noting that Raya's necklace actually looks like it depicts Tanith without her mask. Now you can meet Raya for the first time if you skip the first part of her quest. After completing a few assassinations for the manor, you might notice that a man-serpent has taken Raya's place. Goodness, am I still a serpent? Oh, how dreadful. How dreadful indeed. This is actually Raya herself, whose real name is Zarias. She explains that she was born by the grace of a glorious king. I am proud of what I am, but people are cruel. If they saw my true form, they wouldn't speak to me. And so, I assume a guise when seeking new recruits. But you are not like the rest. Lady Tanith is surprised to hear that Zarais entrusted you with her real name. As her adoptive mother, I ask of you, please be kind to her. Look after young Zarias. Her true visage belies the purity of her heart. Honestly, I hardly deserve the sweet child. The rest of this quest involves uncovering the circumstances of Zarias' birth, leading you to the Serpent Semnion in the Temple of Aigle. Or... Aigle? This item is described to have cradled the poor, unwanted offspring of a repellent birthing ritual. I remember this scent distinctly. Hmm... Funny, isn't it? I am certain of it. I was born inside this. It's a part of my birth, mother." Zarias vanishes in her search for details of her birth, and if you bring this up with Lady Tanith, she'll give you a tonic of forgetfulness. If she discovers the answer to her question, and it causes distress, have her drink this potion, to purge that which would cause her pain. 
Now, the climax of this quest happens deep within the manor's dungeon. I'm afraid there is something I must tell you. I was an unwanted child, born not of grace, but of a hideous ritual. I know that you have done so much for me, but I wish to ask one last kindness. Kill me, please. The player has three choices here. First, you can accept her request and kill her on the spot. Thank you, my champion, mother. Pretty terrible ending, but like every end to this quest, it grants the Datacar's woe talisman, depicting the disturbing likeness of a woman whose skin was flayed. It is said that this woman, named Datacar, indulged in every form of adultery and wicked pleasure imaginable, giving birth to a myriad of grotesque children. It seems that Datacar was the biological mother of Zorias, and the father may have been the god-devouring serpent, who might have once been known as Egle, but has now combined its identity with Praetor Rikard after the serpent consumed him in a blasphemous ritual. You'll get the second ending to this quest by giving Zorias the tonic of forgetfulness from Lady Teneth. Yes, of course. You always were very kind. <sighs> How delightfully sweet. And yet... After this, she'll appear back in the manor after you defeat Praetor Rikard. Oh, it's you. Heaven knows what happened here. But Lady Tanith and all the tarnished champions are gone. It feels rather quiet without them. But with you here, things will be just fine. It's an improvement, but still not quite a happy ending. The best thing to do is ignore both Zorias' request to kill her and Tanith's request to give her the tonic. Once again, you'll have to kill Rikard and meet up with Zorias one last time. You're not willing to kill me, are you? <laughs> I suppose I knew in my heart of hearts how kind and uncompromising you always were. Reloading the area shows that Zorais has left behind a final message for the player. I wish to set out on a journey so that one day I can carry on Mother's work. Be the proud daughter of Tanith of Volcano Manor. Farewell. You've always been so kind, so uncompromising. My champion. Let's just assume that this doesn't include the whole devouring champions part of Tanith's work. So, despite what some people may think, these kinds of games aren't exclusively about tragedy. There are a few other heartwarming quests like this, and even the ones involving death often depicted as a somber, yet fulfilling ending. I think this is part of why so many people enjoy the setting of these games. In a world where suffering and tragedy might be seen as the norm, the stories of triumph will end up shining that much brighter. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.